Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Naomi, for this lovely introduction. Um, and I hope I can kind of meet the demands uh, of very important <laughs> questions <laughs> you're putting forward. I'll do I'll do my best um, <laughs> Thanks, to, to address at least some of them. And I think it's interesting to be kind of coming after the um, uh, the, the, the block on kinship um, as well, because I think there will be a lot of resonances um, with the with the kind of maintaining that uh, people I'm going to be talking about um, are doing in relation to what Phoebe um, and Liz were already talking about. So I think, uh, and I felt very inspired with the talks. Um, and it's really great to be part of this conversation, even though there's a slight shift in context, both geographically, but also in terms of practice, as I will be sort of reflecting on the maintenance work done by others rather than by myself as a practitioner, although I have done a lot of this maintenance work when living uh, with the communities where I um, did my research um, as well. So I became part of this kind of network of, of sustaining um, community life um, in rural Japan. So my work in depopulating Japan has um, kind of taught me the importance of maintenance, the, the urgency that comes with the need for preservation and continuity that often goes hand in hand with the need for financial support, human resources, and also various forms of labor, including complex community and family-based networks that, that really enable um, all of these things to happen. But I have also learned that maintenance goes hand in hand with failure, compromise and, and striving for the imaginary futures uh, that Phoebe was talking about that may never be realized, um, but it nonetheless helps people to push boundaries of what is actually possible. And it does not matter whether it concerns mundane repairs of physical structures of Buddhist temples, like fixing, fixing a roof or repairing um, a heritage designated, designated Buddhist statue that is in your care, or um, efforts to mitigate against the kind of collapse of basic community networks like monthly community cleanups, um, neighborhood kind of watch uh, practices, um, and kind of, or even um, kind of maintaining farming collectives within the community. Um, so the question that I find interesting um, here um, and kind of speaking to the theme is also thinking about the limits of maintenance in such conditions and how people adapt their practices and mindsets to them to also deliver their communities to future generations, uh, but also to make kind of living here and now possible and digestible uh, because those future generations might, might be absent. They might just not be there. That prospect uh, might just not, not actually exist for them. So for a bit of um, geographical context, um, Maybe um, just to, as we're moving from UK to Japan, I just want to bring you uh, visually there. So um, my work is based in rural Hiroshima, uh, the kind of northern parts are all in red. That's kind of Hiroshima prefecture. Um, and I spent 12 months actually researching and living in one of the tr uh, true land Buddhist temples where I spent time shadowing the head priest and his family. Uh, but it also involved many conversations and work and time spent with Buddhist priests, their families in other temples, lay supporters, uh, so parishioners, if you will, uh, neighbors and community leaders and kind of doing all sorts of um, interesting work um, with them. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of place to take you like on this imaginary journey of, of planting you in, in lovely Hiroshima through different um, Waking up at 5 a.m. was part of that maintenance practice. So here you are. Um, and you can see there is some restoration work going on there. I'll come back to that story later. But first of all, I think maybe a little note about Buddhism in Japan is necessary just to kind of give you the context, um, but without kind of going through the whole history of de development of tradition uh, in there. But Buddhist temples, um, and what you can see here in this image is the head priest on the right and his son basically making uh, okonomiyaki, uh, which is like fried pancakes uh, for dinner after we finish for the day. Um, so uh, Buddhist temples are often run by temple families and are essentially family, family run institutions inherited usually from father to son and so on. Even though there is a temple board, 
uh, that kind of helps and supports running of the of that. But in terms of accountability for the financial well, well being of the temple, it rests with the head priest. Um, effectively. So maintaining of this practice of inherited priesthood also faces challenges in Japan today, especially in rural areas. So this model of, let's call it inherited Buddhism, is also linked to how Buddhism is lived and practiced in Japan today. And it is tied to death-related practices of memorialization and the notion of family, caring for the ancestors, caring for the, de for the dead, so keeping that connection um, um, to, um, through Buddhist practice. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, disruption caused um, um, by demographic changes and especially depopulation poses a real challenge to that form of practice as well. So when the next generation, as I mentioned, is not there. So the kind of so social and karmic connections, I want you to kind of keep um, that, um, um, that link uh, in your um, in your mind when when I'm discussing some of these um, some of these practices and uh, of maintenance. Uh, but maybe just very quickly before I move into the stories of maintenance, um, I felt um, that maybe it's useful to understand also what the demographic transformation means um, in Japan. So Japan's population is aging faster uh, than any other nation, except for kind of South Korea is chasing, Germany is chasing, Italy is chasing in the European context as well, um, with a sharp decline since 1980s and with 1.6 million population drop in the last seven years. So that's, I think that's huge, right? So many, um, so many deaths. Um, in just seven years. And the population pyramid has changed dramatically since the 1950s, where it kind of resembled this more steady triangle um, as both birth rates and death rates have declined, it moved into this more sort of kite shaped um, pattern. Um, and in 2021, the age population, so people who are 65 and over, was 36.2 million, which is roughly one in every four people. So that's kind of like almost 30% um, of your population. And depopulation um, in the content and depopulation that kind of is linked to this demographic trend with the movement of the internal migration, uh, especially um, from 1970s onwards, move from rural areas into the urban centers um, like Tokyo, for instance, like Osaka, like um, like Hiroshima as well, um, have been um, quite um, quite huge. Um, and very often depopulation is presented as this kind of statistical fact, if you will. So according to the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, in 2019, nearly 60% of Japan's regions were designated as depopulated, but within those 60%, only 8.6% of Japan's population lives. So less than 10% of, um, of, and I think if we talk about the UK, the numbers are not that dissimilar either, but the scale is greater if you think that only 70% of Japanese land is actually uh, livable. So the concentrations are quite, um, quite big. Uh, but Sorry, but for many of my um, interlocutors, people who I worked with in rural Hiroshima, the population was not just a statistical fact, but a state of mind and a moment of in-betweenness. So when I asked if they feel their community was depopulated and I arrived and I used to go on my runs and stop by the garden and say like, good morning, hi, uh, and forcing people to talk to me. And I was saying, I'm here to research depopulation. Very often they were like, what, here? No, 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 <laughs> what are you talking about? If you wanna see the population, go up north, go to Shimane. And they might have a point, because if you have a look at those maps here, anything that is green, red, and yellow is showing various degrees of depopulation. Um, and the left one is Hiroshima, the right one is Shimane. So Shimane is ferrying significantly worse, but they have this consciousness that we are not quite there yet and we can do things in the meantime. We might be heading in that direction. Uh, and I think that sense of heading in that direction is the awareness is there. So this is not to say that people were oblivious to the transformations, to the challenges, to the threats posed both to the temples and communities. And perhaps Lauren Ballant would call it a bit of a cruel optimism um, going on there, 
but rather they were sort of carefully evaluating the, 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 the current status quo, that position they're experienced somewhat in between no longer, not quite there yet, where the parameters of what decline meant in their life uh, and their community life were kind of being renegotiated on, on daily basis. Um, and working in that space uh, helped me capture the anxieties of change over time and kind of people's ways of dealing with, with, the, with the change and anxiety. And um, there was one really stark image, and I remember never taking the photograph of it, and I regret it, but in the local community um, center, there was this paper, um, A4 kind of paper card that tracked people's, the population within the very local community, within the village. And it was updated on daily basis. So there was a new card with the handwritten number of um, members of the community written on it. And I thought it was very striking, kind of this, th th there isn't even any point printing it, right? And keep it um, a record or laminating it. It's just, it's it's changing on daily basis. And it's, and it's very, very true. So the municipality where I um, did my research has a population of under 50,000 with over 40% of population age 65 and over. So if you compare it to other places, it is pretty low, um, but it's not to say that they are not facing all of these, uh, all of these struggles and um, what we might call active membership of community members, both in community life, but also in temple activities is uh, being affected. Um, and it's kind of dwindling, uh, and by effect, it kind of impacts the, the activities and the finances um, of, of that. Um, okay, so hopefully, and I don't want to, I know we're trying to be so optimistic, the last two talks are so optimistic, and I'm so sorry, I'm moving into the optimism in a, in a moment, but hopefully uh, you are getting an image of a region and religion and religious communities as well are kind of in crisis. And I think it is important to understand crisis. And I think it helps us with imagining maintenance as something that is possible when we imagine crisis not as a moment of rupture, but kind of this undercurrent of anxiety, kind of slow, often even unnoticeable, unnoticeable uh, decay or kind of quiet unspoken fear. Uh, but, but also all of these feelings might um, create spaces for resistance, for resilience, for creativity. We're sort of sticking with the troubles, like Donna Haraway might say, uh, make um, unexpected collaborations and kind of reimagining kin relations possible um, when, when people try to um, maintain their community. So, okay. So what this um, means, so what this striving for survival in, in those conditions that I just um, shaped, uh, and maintaining community structures looks like on the ground and kind of what communities um, of care against all odds might look like. Um, so here I want you to think about kind of the context of your own lives where you might need to, uh, where, where you might have strove or chose to maintain a practice, a relationship, a thing um, that maybe didn't have a, a possible future, uh, but what it really felt and what it required um, from you. Uh, and I think what we're gonna be looking at um, at the moment, I think it speaks back to Liz was talking about a little bit, is kind of what are the structures that actually, uh, that are being maintained, but are damaging versus what, what is the degree of possibility of change um, in reality? Um, if you can't recruit people to to do stuff, um, so I want to, I want to propose to kind of imagine Buddhist temples um, or Buddhist temple communities as networks of belonging that are rooted in both the Buddhist and social notions of interdependence. So, in the Buddhist kind of teaching, interdependence really stimulates imaginaries of people and thinking that what you do really influences the survival of your community, um, the well-being of, of your ancestral lines, and all of these things kind of interconnect. So Buddhist temples are part of and support community structures um, kind of, of self-organizing on the ground level. Um, and this might involve both, uh, and I call it kind of Buddhist economies of belonging because it involves both money, shared labor, human connections that enable this co-stewardship. So really kind of very 
emotional connections to people, right? To the fact that we owe something to someone else, that we feel responsible for somebody else's well-being is really important here. So on one hand, we have this instrumental side of things. And on the other hand, we have these very emotional connections and, and kind of karmic um, connections that are also at stake here. And I have these sort of cogs here, if you will, because I see local temples as part of something um, as part of communities that host them and their survival is only as possible as their own involvement in this in in support of their community and vice versa even though kind of this image I, I often use it because Buddhist temples very much rely on this kind of parishioner networks because the way people belong to Buddhist um communities in Japan is through households. It's not really individual belonging. So this is also important to, to remember. And these little envelopes, they contain money for rituals of commemoration for the dead uh, that I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, but I think that um, seeing that religious institutions um, cannot be sort of seen as separate from um, from the survival of the community is, is important. And the fact that ca they can be a tool for motivating uh, people to, to maintain certain structures that, um, that ensure survival of a community um, for, for better or for worse, um, I guess. Um, but this maintenance um, is associated with social structures. So normally, uh, and this maybe links to that, I should explain. So we have the Buddhist temple, we have Buddhist um, men's association, women's men's aso association, and then we have Jokai, and Jokai is like a neighborhood association. So it has nothing to do with the temple, it's just part of that structure. Uh, but every household would have, and imagine if you, and you have majority of single person households or two elderly people households. So if you issue a member of household as a representative to all of these separate kind of um, representative bodies, if you will, uh, within, within the community, you're running out of people, that's for sure. Um, um, but all of that is sort of interconnected, um, if, um, if you will. Um, and importantly, uh, Buddhist temple family who are essentially the temple is a household in its own right. They also belong to the um, to the neighborhood watch, and the wife of the priest is part of the women's association, and the priest himself is part of the men's association. So all of that is like you. The hierarchy is pretty. It's I don't want to say it's flattened, but it's kind of it, it's really interconnected in that sense. Um, Okay, um, sorry, I think I have like 10 more minutes maybe, is that right? Uh, we've got space for probably about five, uh, five, five more minutes, 10 if okay. you need, thanks. Okay, sure. So um, one thing, for instance, you can see me here in the image because I was part of the temple household. I was there for regular cleanings in the community. So coming together to actually keep physically the community um, tidy, maintained, um, coming together for the kind of farming collective, cleaning out of the rice paddy fields and, and cleaning the, um, the draining channels. I don't know if you've ever seen a rice paddy, but they have like draining um, um, tunnels for flooding the fields and removing that. And for instance, one of the things, uh, one of the tensions that is coming from the younger farmers is that they don't want to flood their fields for ecological reasons and therefore they don't want to take part in any of those activities so they will not bring out um, a member of the community to um, from their family to come and do that kind of work so this is also causing tensions because of people trying to imagine doing things a little bit differently but it brings rupture to thinking can we maintain this community when you only have a limited group of people right um the other aspect is, and I mentioned Jokai. So for instance, if someone dies in a community, um, it's not the family member who calls and arranges the funeral or the um, um, funeral rites. Um, it's the representative of the Jokai who's de dedicated um, to deal with the funeral arrangements for the member of the family. 
Um, so, and here you can see the most of these people on the photograph, they have nothing to do with the fam. They're not a family on the funeral. It's the entire co community that comes together, carries the coffin, calls the priest, arranges all of the different ritual rites and represents it. And back in the day, people were taking time out from work, actually cooking, organizing everything. Now it's not uh, possible, but the kind of, there is that maintenance of that, um, of that connection um, there. The other thing is, for instance, um, is giving, coming together for organizing community events uh, where women from the Buddhist Women Association will come together, cook a meal for the community, um, inviting all the households, um, of course, um, and um, all of the food that is being cooked comes from donations from the community. Um, and this also is causing a lot of tension at local temples because it's not possible to eat through all of that food. And if you imagine we in a farming community and people just, there is only so much people can eat, but they, um, but giving in Buddhist context is a, um, it's a meritorious act. So it's something that improves your karma, right? So people choose the excess food they produce to do something meaningful with it. They give it to the temple and it rots in temple um, kitchens because it cannot be eaten and processed uh, sufficiently. So even though there is kind of maintenance of that, it causes kind of the practical and, and uh, ecological um, tensions. Um, another aspect is actually community coming together to clean and to maintain the interior of the temple. Um, so people come together uh, twice a year to take everything out from the altar, uh, polish it. Um, I really struggled to kind of assemble all of these elements back. So kind of this knowledge uh, within the community, if there is no younger generations kind of taking part in this process, they actually don't, they wouldn't know if you took it apart, you don't know how to put it back together. I, I personally really struggled. So I think there is that importance of, of embodied practice of passing something on that we discussed also in the previous session. Um, another element that I want to mention uh, very briefly is that the importance role of the community um, is to actually fundraise and support um, the repairs of the temple, but also they have this kind of fund of um, neighborhood support. If someone's roof goes down, this money can be deployed to a particular household. Uh, but this um, kind of element of uh, fundraising, so this is a 300 year old um, bell tower. Uh, and as, as you can see, there was a aesthetically problematic or maybe questionable decision made to restore it with the cement legs. And, and this is kind of when I was talking about this compromise of trying to think, or maybe aesthetically speaking, failure, where you have to make decisions that you have done this fundraising, uh, it was very expensive, you are not repairing this gate anytime soon, probably never. So therefore you're gonna use the material. So the choice of the material becomes important and concrete is fairly you know, robust, it can, it can stay. However um, problematic it might, it might look. But I think what was interesting is that the temple used the wood that was taken from underneath it and created rosaries to give it back to, the, to everyone who contributed towards the repair. So they would have something physically concrete. So kind of trying to create that connection uh, back into the community and, and kind of maintain that connection, that, you know, that emotional connection, you've participated, you, you, you supported this. We are still here standing on these ugly concrete legs because you've helped us. And I think that kind of imaginary is also important, the materiality um, that it represents. And my last example, and then I will stop because I know I'm out of time, is that an important and striking feature of uh, rural communities is also abandoned households. So uh, this is a home that didn't have anyone to inherit it. There was no one to maintain it. It was standing, as you can see it, for about 10 years. And I think one of the most kind of soul destroying moments for me during my fieldwork was to actually empty this house and prepare it for bulldozing, bulldozing, sorry. 
Um, and an important element, and you can see it in the image here, is uh, what you call Butsudan. So it's a Buddhist altar that maintains the spirits of all of the ancestors. So of course, there's no one to maintain it. Uh, what do you do with that? Um, and we had a ritual um, to kind of extract the spirits so we could burn it, so we could destroy it in the same way that we destroyed everything else, I guess, uh, in that in that house. I actually brought some stuff from that house uh, because I just felt I couldn't, I asked if I could keep it. Um, so I have a few kind of elements and I and I still think about the woman who, who, who lived there. So I guess maybe her memory somehow will live. Um, but this uh, practice of abandoning Buddhist altars is becoming more and more prominent. So people would like drive in the middle of the night and you can hear a car. So the Buddhist priest thinks, oh gosh, funeral, we run out. Um, and there is a Butsudan standing in the temple ground or a dog that happened too. Um, and is that kind of, I think there is a reaction of trying to maintain the connection because you know you can trust this knowledgeable religious professional to maintain your karmic or spiritual connection without the retribution, uh, but also you can, you choosing, you making a choice not to maintain a particular form of practice. And I think that's quite striking. And this also relates to this intergenerational inheritance from father to son, inspiring kind of the next generation of practitioners, these imageries of, of family that you can see here practicing together. It's really important um, to, to maintain actually Buddhism as is in Japan now. And if that's not possible, what's going to happen? Because you're supposed to practice at the Butsudan every day. You're supposed to care for the, for the graves. Um, and this is Ohaka no Haka, so the gravesite of the graves, uh, which is where all of the Buddhist graves that cannot be maintained go to rest. So if you're no longer looking after your family grave, you can kind of donate it there and it's looked after. So it's kind of dealing with that material presence that is problematic and the spiritual presence that is problematic and outsourcing it almost like decommissioning of care if you will and I think it's interesting to think that maintenance might also mean decommissioning of care and then what are therefore the implications of that sort of practice um, and I have some um, maybe other stories but I'll stop here and just leave you with this image of two hands drawing each other uh, and I like this imaginary um, that comes from the um, uh, Dutch lithographer Mauritius Cornelius Escher, um, where on one hand, we could think about it as people's efforts of mobilizing um, that resemble these hands that constantly sort of are at work to sketch out the networks of lines that acknowledge each other's significance, if you will. And on the other hand, it can help us also imagine a scenario in which one or both hands attempt to erase the lines and, and therefore themselves from the network, right? So kind of removing and opting out from the network is also a possibility uh, and a danger at the same time. Um, and I will stop here. And thank you so much for giving me the time to share this. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, I brought optimism back 